Hello friends, my name is JJ, and as I am sure you know, up here in Canada, we recently celebrated one of the most culturally important days on the Canadian calendar. I refer, of course, to the Super Bowl. In any given year, the Super Bowl is usually the single most watched TV event in Canada, with this year's contest capturing the eyeballs of over 10 million rapt Canadians. But what made this year's Super Bowl uniquely interesting from a Canadian perspective was a particular commercial that ran during it. It was an ad for Crown Royale Whiskey, a very famous Canadian liquor company starring noted aging rock star David Grohl. The ad is only about a minute long, so let's watch it together. Wow. I think we got it. Today, let's thank Canada. Thank you for legends of music and heroes of comedy. Thank you for this heartthrob. Thank you, Canada, for peanut butter, for paint roller, and poutine. That's french fries with cheese and gravy. It's good. Thank you for creating the replay. The walkie. And the battery. The egg carton. The ironing board. The electric wheelchair. Hawaiian pizza. Instant potatoes. Canola oil. Trash bags. And thank you for this. Thank you for giving us hockey, basketball, and thank you for football. What? No way. Yeah. Look it up. Thank you, Canada. Thank you. So obviously this ad tries to have a somewhat shocking tone with all these bombshell revelations of Canadian inventions that are clearly intended to make the Super Bowl's mostly American audience feel humbled or even embarrassed, which no doubt delighted the many millions of Canadians watching because loudly asserting ownership over things that Americans might have assumed they came up with is one of the main ways that Canadians create a sense of identity for themselves. But shallow nationalistic pandering aside, there is is a more interesting question about this ad that many of you guys have been sending me messages about in the aftermath of the game. Namely, are Dave's claims actually true? Are all of the things that he says are Canadian actually Canadian? Well, if your suspicions were raised by the ad's somewhat braggy tone, you weren't wrong. By my calculations of the 20 claims of Canadianness made in this one minute ad, I would say about half are accurate and about half are either dubious or outright false. So let us go through them all. First, the accurate ones. So the celebrities that he lists as being Canadian were in fact all born in Canada, as were the musicians on the records. Whether these people spend much time in Canada these days is a pretty open question. And whether that fact compromises their Canadianness is an important consideration we shall get to a bit later. But for now, let us just give this part of the ad a check. I likewise don't think anyone can really dispute the Canadian credentials of poutine, easily the most iconic Canadian dish. Poutine first caught on with French Canadians in the aftermath of World War II, when fast food culture really took off on this continent and eating French fries with gravy really went mainstream. According to the Poutine page of the official Quebec Tourism Board, a restaurant called Giuseppe in Drummondville was the first place to think to add chunks of white cheddar cheese to the mix and market that as its own thing using the name Poutine. The name Poutine in turn is supposedly some confused Frenchification of the word pudding. Like most food origin stories, I know this one is somewhat disputed and likely apocryphal, but the Giuseppe people themselves certainly seem happy to take the credit. Walkie talkie. This one is even more clear cut. In the 1930s, there was an engineer named Donald Hings who worked for a mining company in the wilds of British Columbia. While there, he invented a two-way field radio initially as a method to allow company planes doing aerial reconnaissance to communicate with workers on the ground. He patented this technology in 1940 and was later hired by the Canadian government to develop two-way radios for allied use in the Second World War. They obviously proved tremendously useful, and Hings died in 2004 as a great Canadian hero. What is interesting about his story, however, is that even though he lived most of his life in Canada, Hings was actually born in England and immigrated with his family as a child. While it would obviously be pretty absurd to claim he was a British inventor, at the same time, I do feel like if the shoe was on the other foot and he had been born in Canada but emigrated to some other country as a kid, 
Canadians would probably claim him as their own. If you don't already get what I mean, you will very soon. Electric wheelchair. The modern electric wheelchair is usually credited to a famous Canadian guy called George Klein, who though not exactly a household name, has still been pretty widely celebrated as one of the greatest Canadians of the 20th century due to his over 1,500 inventions. Canada's Edison, they called him. Klein was born in Hamilton, Ontario, studied at the University of Toronto, and in 1929 was hired to work for the Canadian government's National Research Council in Ottawa, where he lived for the rest of his life. The many inventions that Klein is associated with during his time at the NRC were important, but often quite technical in nature, and thus not terribly sexy, which is probably why his electric wheelchair is the thing he tends to be remembered for the most. It is a tangible, physical thing most people are familiar with, as opposed to, say, the collapsible satellite antenna. Hawaiian pizza. Despite the name, the controversial Hawaiian pizza is usually credited to or blamed on a Canadian guy named Sam Panopoulos, who claims to have created the first ham and pineapple pizza at his restaurant in Chatham, Ontario in 1962. Panopoulos seems to have been a pretty good self-promoter, and his death in 2017 saw an explosion of sympathetic profiles that have now firmly consolidated his legacy. His invention and the divisive debate it created lives on. Canola oil. So canola is a type of plant primarily used to make cooking oil. It is a breed of the rather unfortunately named rapeseed plant that was first developed in Canada during the 1960s. The rapeseed plant was easy to grow, but not great to eat. So bioengineering it into canola is considered one of the great success stories of Canadian agriculture, given how popular canola oil is these days. Fun fact, the name canola is literally just an abbreviation for Canadian oil. Trash bag. World War II saw great innovations made in plastics technology, including the invention of flexible polyurethane, which could be used as a cheap substitute for rubber. After the war, ambitious entrepreneurs began dreaming up all sorts of creative uses for the stuff, and two men from Manitoba came up with the idea of making polyurethane bags to store all of the copious amounts of garbage that prosperous post-war families were suddenly generating. In the 1960s, the major American chemical company Union Carbide bought the two men out and started selling polyurethane garbage bags under the brand name LAD. Whoopee Cushion. The Whoopee Cushion was invented by a Toronto-based firm known as Gem Rubber Co. in the 1930s. They sold the idea to the Johnson Smith Company, an American mail-order outfit famous for selling all sorts of random nonsense on the back pages of comic books and things. I'm sure you will recognize their iconic ads. All right, so those were some legit Canadian inventions. Let us now get to the dubious ones. Peanut butter. So one of the problems with lists like these is that the question of who invented something can often be incredibly subjective. And this is because often throughout history, there will be times in which several different people independently all come up with a very similar idea around the same time. And in these types of situations, credit often winds up going to the person who just did the most to bring the idea into the mainstream as opposed to simply thinking of it first. And this seems to be very much the case when it comes to deciding who should get credit for peanut butter. So in the late 19th century, new agricultural technologies created a huge boom in American peanut production. And this in turn saw a huge uptick in interest in using peanuts to make all sorts of different foods. Records show that a guy from Quebec named Marcellus G. Edson got a US patent in 1884 for what he described as a paste of peanuts to be used in the manufacture of sweet meats and candy. Sweet meats being an old fashioned name for candy. But as no less an authority than the Canadian Encyclopedia notes, there is no evidence that Edson's peanut candy was commercially sold or advertised as peanut butter. In fact, Edson doesn't seem to have done much with his life beyond file this one patent and absolutely nothing is known about him. There's not even a surviving photograph. This book? Creamy and Crunchy, An Informal History of Peanut Butter, The All-American Food by John Krampner, is overall pretty skeptical of the idea that any one person in the late 19th century should be considered the inventor of peanut butter, given how much 
peanut experimentation was going on at the time. But he also does say that if we had to pick someone to be peanut butter's founding father, a guy from St. Louis called George A. Bale would probably be the most plausible candidate. Bale's late 19th century food company seems to have been the first to have actively mass-produced and sold peanut butter to the public in a form we would recognize today. Edson, for what it's worth, is not mentioned in this book at all. Paint roller. So the story goes that there was this guy from Toronto named Norman Brakey who came up with the idea of the paint roller in the 1940s. But as this story in the Globe and Mail notes, he was also an unsophisticated entrepreneur with no real sense of how to sell his invention. So his innovation and indeed he himself were easily ignored and today his memory is only kept alive through a sort of patriotic folklore and Canadian trivia books and things. His whole story is also contradicted by the tale of a guy from Ohio named Richard C. Adams, who worked for the famous Sherwin-Williams Paint Company. Adams claims to have independently invented the paint roller around the same time as Norman Brakey, and Sherwin-Williams successfully filed a patent for the invention in 1942. And thus, they became rich and successful in a way that poor Norman did not. The replay. Giving any one person credit for inventing the instant replay is also fairly dubious, given that pretty much as soon as TV cameras were invented, using them to record and immediately play back dramatic moments of sporting events to help entertain audiences or assist referees in making calls was a fairly obvious idea that seems to have occurred to a lot of people. During a live broadcast of a hockey game in 1955, a clever producer at the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation apparently used fast developing film to create a crude replay of a single goal that aired several minutes after the fact. And over the years, this one rather limited anecdote has been spun by the Canadian patriotism industrial complex into a legend of Canada inventing the instant replay. In reality, the ability to do instant replays was a slow process that evolved alongside camera technology. With the 1970s usually recognized as the era uh, in which the idea became a mainstream part of televised sports, including on the CBC. Battery. So battery is again such a broad category of thing, it's hard to give any one person credit for them. In the simplest sense, a battery is just something that stores energy in some way, and people have been dreaming up ways to do this for centuries. Batteries of this sort, however, the kind we use in remote controls and things, are known as alkaline batteries, and were developed in the late 1950s as a longer lasting alternative to zinc batteries. The guy who gets credit for inventing this type of battery was a scientist named Louis Burry, who grew up in Ontario. After graduating college, he went to work for the Ever Ready Corporation in Cleveland, a division of Union Carbide, and it's here where he did his work inventing alkaline battery technology. He never did return to Canada, becoming a US citizen in 1960. He is buried in Ohio. Egg carton. So in the old days, people used to transport eggs in baskets, which you had to carry very slowly and delicately, and often over the course of several trips. I mean, only a complete idiot would risk putting all of his eggs in one basket. In the early 20th century, a guy from British Columbia called Joseph Coyle said, there's got to be a better way, and invented this, a painstakingly hand-folded cardboard box with little individual compartments for a dozen eggs. But even after machines got involved, his design was still too time-consuming to make, and the battle to make a better cardboard carton raged on for decades. A much stronger and simpler carton, made out of molded paper pulp, would eventually be developed in the 1950s by a Brit named H.G. Bennett, which is actually the style of carton that appears in the ad. So again, we find some plausibly competing claims, making it hard to know who exactly deserves the credit. The guy who had the idea first, but couldn't make it work, or the guy who made it work, but didn't necessarily come up with the idea. Ironing board. In 1874, an inventor named Elijah McCoy successfully patented a contraption described as a folding ironing table that is broadly similar to the ironing boards we use today. McCoy was born in Ontario as the son of escaped slaves, but moved to Michigan in his early 20s, where he lived the rest of his life and came up with the many inventions that would eventually see him inducted into the Inventors Hall of Fame. A great man, surely. A great Canadian, 
Eh. Instant potatoes. Along with plastics, World War II unleashed a ton of innovation in the realm of food dehydration technology that was later adapted for civilian use. And much like egg cartons, instant replays, and peanut butter, dehydrated potatoes seems to be an idea that occurred to many people in the early post-war years. With a guy from Philadelphia called Miles Willard, usually given most of the credit for pioneering and patenting much of the modern tech for making so-called instant potato products. However, around the same time, there was also a food scientist from Ottawa named Edward Asselbergs, and he made more than his fair share of important innovations in this most critical of industries as well. Basketball. The idea that Canada invented basketball is one of my biggest pet peeves. Basketball was invented by a guy called James Naismith, who was born in Ontario, but moved to Massachusetts in his 20s after getting hired by Springfield College. It was at Springfield College that he invented basketball, which is something the school remains very proud of to this day. Much like the battery guy, Naismith never returned to Canada and became a US citizen in 1925. He is buried in Canada. Kansas. To call basketball a Canadian invention thus requires some pretty creative twisting of what it means for something to be Canadian. Apparently, the inventor could have consciously left Canada and made his invention entirely outside of Canada's borders, but Canada still gets to take the credit. This is what I like to call the Hotel California theory of Canadian identity. You can check out any time you like, but you can never leave. Football. Despite Dave telling us to look it up, as if Canada inventing football is some easily verifiable fact, in reality, most sports historians generally agree that no one person invented football per se. It is simply a unique game that evolved out of British rugby in a vague and experimental way during the mid-19th century. It's not even widely agreed when we can accurately say that the first football game was played before a public audience. The idea that Canada invented football rests on this idea that the game was officially born on May 14th, 1874, which was when students from Montreal's McGill University played a public game against a team from Harvard University. One thing everybody does agree on, however, is that modern football evolved as a way for snobby colleges to compete against each other, as we learned in my award-winning video on the history of balls. The May 15th game was played according to McGill University rules, which, as the argument goes, were closer to the modern rules of football than some of the other college rules of the time. But even then, no one today would recognize McGill rules football as being the modern game. In the years that followed, college teams would continue to experiment and tweak the game's rules in various ways, and there were all sorts of different conferences and committees that attempted to set universal standards for American football, right up until the founding of the American Professional Football Association, the precursor to the NFL in 1920. So it's fine to say that the creation of the modern game of American football was something that Canadians contributed to, in the same way that Canadians contribute to a lot of American culture, but we didn't invent it. So there you have it, my award-winning analysis of Canadian inventions. I would say that this list of things represents a pretty standard canon of inventions that Canadians are taught to be proud of, so it's not surprising to see them featured in an ad that was obviously supposed to pander to Canadian audiences. But truth matters more than stroking the patriotic ego. So I hope you appreciated this effort to do a bit of a fact check on old Dave. Good music, though. Anyway, I would be curious to know if you guys know of any other good stories of great inventions that are somewhat dubiously associated with a certain person or place. Thank you so much for watching, and I will see you all next week.